Yeah, whenever we're ready. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, first question. Um, can, could you explain uh, what what it is that you do? Or okay. Uh, currently, as of October last year, I became the general manager of 31 Digital. Um, I started here as a volunteer in 2005 and uh, worked up all the way to the top. Went from production manager to programming manager to digital media and was it digital media programming and broadcast manager to number of titles. But now currently I am general manager. So as general manager, do you report to anyone? I report to a board of directors. Um, so the only people above me are a voluntary uh, board, uh, different people from all walks of life. There's no one from the television industry. Uh, they're pretty much all entrepreneurs or self-made men and women um, from different organizations around Brisbane who are passionate about community TV and want to help out in any way they can, opening doors that we normally wouldn't be able to open. Um, they say, yeah, so kind of uh, handed the keys to the kingdom and all the toys to the playground. Off I was running. Okay, so what would your background be? Uh, fresh out of high school, I went into radio, uh, where I spent six years um, writing, performing, um, and producing numerous different radio programs in the U.S., as well as doing stand-up comedy um, and pro wrestling to an extent. Well, I was doing it. Um, and then came to Australia in 2001. Um, and was quickly told I had the wrong accent for radio, uh, so I started going back to doing computer graphics and web and stuff that I really like to do, and taught myself how to do motion graphics and editing. Um, while I was doing a TAFE course while going through immigration, I um, started doing a lot of more editing, a lot more motion graphics, started volunteering at 31, and uh, that's how I ended up when the previous production manager went to Channel 9, they approached me for the job. Um, so I, I ended up been there, been here ever since. Alright. So when you were production manager and while well, you've been general manager, mm -hmm. have you had to approve any program that would uh, maybe conflict with the programming that you were, you were doing? Um, no, not particularly. Uh, I mean, like conflicting as in almost the same show. Pretty much, yeah. Oh, uh, well, yes, then. Recently, um, as, as, y as you know, and hopefully some people know, um, I do a show called The Late Night Show, um, which is, you know, you just run in the middle generic late night television talk show. Um, and recently, and I started doing that when I was a program manager here. Um, and I've produced two series like it before, but this was the first one that I was the host of and, and lead writer. Um, and then I had to approve. Um, well, I didn't have to approve it. Um, I, another show came in with, that was almost an exact copy. I mean, my show's not a heavily original program, so it wasn't like I, s I created the mold, you know. I'm using the mold that's been set up since the 50s in the U.S. television, but it, it was kind of felt like it was stepping on my toes slightly, but at the same time, it's such an open genre the, of that type of show, so I, I was happy that somebody else wanted to give it a go as much as I did, so I was happy to approve it. The only thing I, I think I, I would have probably started getting upset is if, um, you know, uh, writers or production members or uh, guests were getting pinched, <laughs> but um, that never ended up happening, and um, that show has run its course already as opposed to we're aiming up, aiming up for our third series of uh, another 44 weeks of production, so, yeah, posers come and go. <laughs> right. yeah. uh, you've just mentioned two other uh, programs that you were involved in before the mm -hmm. Late Night Show. Uh, can you explain a little bit about those? Yeah, I've always been a huge fan of late night television uh, in the U.S. Grew up on Johnny Carson and Dave Letterman and Conan O'Brien. Um, more recently, you know, become a massive fan of Craig Ferguson, but Johnny Carson was always my, my guy. Um, when he, you know, died in the 90s, I, I always felt that there was like a, a, a real opening where just everyone was having a late night show all of a sudden. Um, when I came to Australia, there wasn't any late night shows on, on Australian TV at the time. I mean, there was Dave Letterman, you know, that they get off the satellite. He was on, you know, midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., depending on whatever brilliant, uh, r reality TV show Channel 10 held on the time. And Rove was there as well, um 
I've never really seen Rove as much as a late night talk show's host because he's I, I personally don't like what he does. I respect what he does, but I don't like what he does. It's not my personal flavor. He's, he aims at a different crowd than I run. Um, but I was uh, quite interested in um, Graham Kennedy and uh, Don Lane, you know, especially Don Lane being another American who had his own late night show here in Australia, and I thought it would be quite fun to do. Um, I've always been I've been doing stand up comedy since I was about fifteen, so I've always written comedy and written stuff with other people. And I met a gentleman named Dan Smith, who um, had a YouTube show called Dan Smith 180, and he sent it in as a um, audition for another show that we were doing. And I quite liked what he did. It was a little monologue, uh, so I quite liked it. And I started developing the first late night show on. 31, which was called Dan Smith 180, as I was executive producer and writer, and he was lead writer and host. And we did about 30 episodes um, before he got itchy feet and decided he wanted to do something more serious and more meaningful, so he wanted to do a current affairs news program that we were doing here. Um, so he jumped over to that, and uh, I kind of started developing a new one um, with, a, with a different host. Um, but then he came back and we started doing Last Night Tonight um, with him as host and that lasted about seven weeks before he decided to go to America. Uh, so then we had roving, uh, rotating hosts and I was one of them and uh, quite enjoyed doing it. I got the bug for performing again and thought I really like doing this. Why bother? Why bother getting another host? I can do it. Um, so I, I started doing late night show, and I, I wanted a classic name. Didn't want to be try to be too clever and say what it is. So I wanted to say what it was. And late night show, the late night show, and late night show dot com were both available. So I went, oh, why beat around the bush? Let's just call it the late night show. And yeah, that's where it's been. We've been, we've done. This will be entering our third season. We've already done about fifty episodes, sixty episodes, sixty episodes, and. Um, um, it's been quite fun, quite easy to do, so I keep doing it. Uh, what what sort of other program do you have at the station? Uh, currently, uh, well, uh, since I've been here, we've pr I've produced personally a number of different programs for the station. Um, some of them have been high raters, some of them have been fizzers, but, you know, that's television. Uh, as, as a producer for the station, um, I had the privilege of doing a program called Schlock Treatment, um, which was a rehash of an old idea that 31 had with a, a local guru of cult cinema, and we had the pleasure of having the highest rated program ever in the history of, of Brisbane Community Television, um, where we pulled 180,000 viewers for one episode, and it never been matched since, Never, no one's even come close, and we still even don't know how it happened. Um, and I've done pro wrestling shows, different comedy shows, um, which have all been fun. The station itself is in an interesting position because we produce a lot of content ourselves. Um, we have the caravan and camping show, we have the boat show, which are your more travel doc, um, travel magazine type shows. Um, we do a lot of studio-based discussion programs like Meet the Ministers, where we, we meet the politicians in their local area. Um, art Studio, which is a, an art program which teaches you how to paint, which is fantastic and, and does really well among all different types of age brackets because it kind of speaks to everyone. Um, and in the future, 2012, we uh, really prepare to up that again and, and just start churning out more uh, chat shows, more studio-based interview programs, more music programs, more arts programs, um, and more indigenous programs. Um, and I hope a lot more West End South Brisbane focused content. I think uh, the station has for a long time been kind of not ignoring but um, looking past its own backyard and I think there's so many colorful personalities and interesting people in West End and South Bank and South Brisbane that I, I just I, why look any further than your own backyard you know they're right around the corner and uh, really start doing a lot of shows that represent West End, South Bank and South Brisbane. Uh, so have you had anyone from the from the like the cultural center just around the corner here, come up to you and say we want to do a program. Um, not yet. A lot of people, I think, are under the misconception that it's really, really hard to do 
community TV or television in general, and the secret is that it isn't very hard. Um, there's a lot of pre-planning and a lot of organizing and stuff like that, but really once you, you start filming frame one, it's just a snowball and it just keeps going. You just got to kind of st stay on for the ride. Um, we've recently started a, an, an alliance sort of with QUT who's doing a research um, on why community grant community organizations don't implement community media more in what they do, um, considering that's what we're all here for. A lot of community organizations do the personally uh, since I became GM I've really tried to partner up with a lot of the community radio stations uh, I think you know instead of trying to be viewed as competition we should all work together and try to, to better the community broadcasting sector in, in Brisbane um, which has been really receptive by some of the, the bigger stations community stations um, but yeah no, not, a lot, not a lot of them uh, this year is kind of the year I want people to think oh that's well and good that we're doing this but it's 31 involved and if they're not, they're kind of like, well, why not? You know, I want us to be on the tip of everyone's tongue this year and, and really um, help drive a lot of the um, ideas that the community organizations have. So has anyone sort of been broadcast on 31 and gone on to the commercial Oh, yeah, no, definitely. Um, probably the two most famous ones would be um, Blokes World Did It. Uh, Bloke's World, which, you know, of course is a, a, a guy's show or four guys, you know, and showing pretty ladies and bikes and paintball and all that kind of stuff. Um, they famously went to one of the commercials, I can't remember which one it was, and signed a ridiculous contract and uh, essentially got mis used slightly um, and they had a big legal battle with it. And So they, they did it. Um, Probably the most, the luckiest one lately has been uh, the Bazira Project on ABC2. Um, they were on, they started on Melbourne, the C31, and uh, we took them on. We were the only other station that really took them on and really profiled them heavily. Um, and they went to war with TV Week over the community TV being eligible for the Logies. Um, which is funny because at the time when they did that, they didn't have a show on TV. And then, yeah, just saw them pop up again on. ABC2 uh, with a whole new show, big budget and all that kind of stuff, so they really made their mark uh, on there and, and it's still really nice, you know, I get Facebook comments from them all the time saying how much they like the station still and, and how much they support community TV, so it's nice to see Salam Cafe was another one that went to SBS, Facilities Garden uh, from Melbourne also went on SBS, but only lasted a season and realized he liked it better on community TV, so jumped back to community TV um, yeah, there's, it can happen and has happened. I mean, Rove is obviously the, obviously the, the big media TV. darling. Yeah, that that started off on community TV and and went to the big leagues. Same with uh, Hamish and Andy and Peter Hellier and Curran Grant. They all started with him. John Saffron, you know, was a guest on a lot of the community shows. So, but he was more on that um, race. Was it the race around the world thing, not the race or whatever the, the journals on the show where they did. I can't remember what it's called. I wasn't here at the time, but I know he did a show before that. <laughs> um, yeah, but it, it can happen, and that's what we're here for. It, I think uh, a lot of behind-the-camera people do it more than in front of the camera. Um, a lot of people get trained up in community TV and, and get pinched by the commercials to, to work behind the scenes, which is good, great. It's happened here quite recently. Um, one of our staff members went to Channel 7 and uh, done in... Um, Canberra, and another staff member is just left to go to a, a bigger production company. Right. So it happens. Yeah. So, uh, with the studio-based program that gets produced here, mm. um, how many people would you, would the station have working on one of those at a given time? Uh, as employees, or just at, in total people? Yeah. Total people. Total people working on a, a we'll say, late night show exam as the best example because that's the one I'm, I most know about. Um, we essentially had five crew on uh, any show. I mean, obviously, it, it fluctuates with a lot of times we bring in people to train them while doing it, so it could be go up to as much as ten. But basically, you have a, a director, a floor manager, a person to run the teleprompter, a uh, sound person, and and uh, another you know runner. And that's about it cameras are stationary so the cameras move and obviously you had camera people so at any given time I think mostly five people per show 
which is good because you know bring them in, make them, send them out, bring the next show in, and, you know, kind of turn them out. Oh, yeah. So does the station do outside broadcasting? Uh, we do. We did have a van, our own van, at some stage, uh, but now we just kind of rent one when we need it because we don't do a lot of it. Um, we've covered hockey, um, soccer, f- baseball, AFL, rugby, you know, um, all different types of sport. Um, we've also done uh, awards nights. We did the um, what was it, the Screen Queensland Awards Night. Um, one year, uh, so we do a lot of, um, we can do it, um, um, we can't do it live, because we don't have that kind of satellite technology that they use to do it live, um, but we do, um, do outside broadcasting, um, where people get some cool hand-on experience, most recently we've been doing some baseball coverage, um, which is for the Brisbane Bandits, which has been quite fun. I have said you broadcast there games uh, at the moment for this season because we started organization with them they, they approached us late before their season started I think we had about two weeks um, we s- just decided to do a, a, a sports program in the studio now more recently we actually shoot it at the stadium um, where it's a, a, a roundup of all their games but next year uh, for next season we are going to cover games for them right. fingers crossed so how would an ind- how would an independent producer come to you and say uh, you yeah well it's uh, th- there's two main ways uh, a TV show can get well three really three shows uh, can get made here one an independent producer can make it and bring it to us that's that's probably the easiest way they they uh, keep the rights to it they keep the intellectual property we just get their rights to broadcast it um they can approach us and enter into a co-production, which when we own the physical show, but they still own the intellectual property, and it doesn't cost them anything, um, or they can hire us to, to f- make something for them. Um, if they just have the idea but have no idea what to do it, but have sponsors that want to make it, they can pay us and we can make it, and they own it. Um, most popular probably is the co-production or the independent production. Uh, co-production is quite easy. You submit a proposal um, for a studio-based show. We only do co-productions currently on studio-based stuff because it doesn't cost us much insurance and stuff if stuff gets broken. Um, so we do, if it's a studio-based program, you, you send a submission. It goes to our programming committee. We discuss it. You know, is this doable? Is this something we want to do? Is it, you know, is is this going to be a waste of time or is it going to be an exciting program that will put on ratings? If we all agree that it's uh, something we'll do, we call the person in for a meeting, sit down, work out the whole pre-production of the show, how it's going to look, how it's going to run, do a run sheet. Well, then we'll do a um, do all the graphics up. We'll do a dress rehearsal or one or two dress rehearsals so that the crew and everything get the, the use of the show. You can kind of find out if some things are going to work or if they don't. And then it goes into production. Usually for a pilot season of six, and then if it's successful and does well, or people like it, or it's easy to do, we'll just continue on for another 12, or if it's an ongoing show, then we'll just keep making it. Um, but yeah, so a lot of independent producers, if they have their own gear, which most people do these days, they can make a show um, of six or 12 or five or whatever, and just send it in, and if and we can put it on. Um, it only starts getting complicated if they want to buy a sponsorship, but most people can just send it in for free, and we'll play it. Right. So I'm guessing you'd have some sort of agreement, almost pre-made. Yeah. Um, if, if if it's a, a an independent production, they would sign a broadcast agreement, a uh, free-to-air broadcast agreement, if they don't want to pay for stuff, um, which just says that they own it. They acknowledge that everything in it, they have the rights to. Um, so if someone comes and says, hey, you used my music and I didn't give you permission, that's their problem, not our problem. Um, and we had the right to show it. That's essentially, or replay it, show it and replay it, um, and maybe use some of the footage to make uh, promotional material, such as promos on air to say when it's on, or something for our website to say that the show's on. Um, 
or a highlight reel of what the best stuff of the station is that, that goes around. But that's about it. The the owner keeps the, the, the rights of the show so they can sell the DVDs and all that kind of stuff. And, and we sell it to another station if they want. Yeah, if they want. Um, that's happened. You know, where we, we've been showing a show and some of it's all of a sudden we get a letter from one of the commercials saying we have to cease and desist and not play it anymore because they bought it. So, so that's fine. That's what we don't mind. I mean, unless it's a really, really good show, and then in which case we do mind a little bit, but what are you going to do? You're not going to fight them. Uh, um, so have, has the programming committee sort of ever approved a show that so either bombed or they've later regretted approving? Um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of things work on paper that don't end up working on air. Um, or you can just come into personal disagreements or um, one of the more popular things that happens is the talent that you work with end up having very diva-ish qualities to them where demands are high or they want to all of a sudden do something. Uh, the previous management used to call, uh, used to call it um, turning it into making Ben-Hur where it went from a simple idea to all of a sudden we're doing 12 camera shoots and you know bringing in dance troops and you know all this kind of stuff so it can get some people all of a sudden think that they're they're making a TV show they need to go huge and there's a billion dollar budget and they can do all types of things and they don't realize that no we signed on this and we're only going to make this we're not going to to blow our budget especially a lot of times that's when they're, they're co-productions and we're actually footing the bill for the whole thing so um, it can happen Usually a lot of people are understanding and you just have to kind of say, you know, pull your head in a little bit and uh, we're only going to do this. If you want to do that, you got to start paying for it. And then they start to realize that um, only occasionally in the past has everyone ever done the, the huge diva thing and said, you can't do this without me and if I leave, what are you going to do? And, you know, I'll take all my viewers with me. And it never really works out that way. But, um, yeah. Recently, I think there, there was one program that ended up being a lot more time-consuming and, and not really worth the effort. It didn't rate at all, um, and it was it took days and days to film two episodes. Um, and it's so it was just something that we killed si after the pilot season of six, and just said, "Oh, sorry, we're not gonna, we're not prepared to do it again. If you want to do it, go and make it and, and give it to us, but we're not going to do it." Okay. I think that's pretty much it for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lord. No worries, Beth.